Hey, let's stand and sing. Father, we worship you. We worship your name, the name that is above all names. Uh, God, we put you where you belong. Um, so, Lord, you can do what you desire uh, this morning. So that is, uh, that is our desire is to see your kingdom come um, and to see your purposes um, unfold and be met, Jesus. Uh, we love you so, so much. It's your new name we pray. Amen. Sing it out, let love explode. Let love explode and breathe the dead to life. A love so bold to see a revolution so high. Let love explode and breathe the dead to life. Oh, may it be a love so bold to see a revolution. Somehow, now I'm lost in your freedom. Yeah, in this world. Let hope arise. Come on, lift it up. Let hope arise and make the darkness high. My faith is dead. I need a resurrection somehow. Let hope arise and make the darkness high. My faith.
beautiful, isn't it? It's beautiful we get to, what we get to partake of. Scripture says, come with what you do not have and buy what is undeserved. Hmm. Isn't that beautiful that we get to partake in this? That this is what we get to call life now. Amen. Jesus, you are so beautiful. Sing about when darkness comes. Come on. When darkness tries to roll over my bones. When sorrow comes to steal the joy out. When brokenness and pain is all I know, I won't be shaken. No, I won't be shaken. Cause my feet doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My feet doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My feet doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Yeah. Shame no longer has a place. Shame no longer has a place to hide. I am not a captive to the lies. Oh, you're free, church. Come on. I'm not afraid to leave my past behind. Oh, I won't be shaken. No, I won't be shaken. My feet doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My feet doesn't stand a chance when I stand. Church, you may be seated. All right. Well, I welcome you to First Methodist Church Midlothian. It's a joy to be with you here today. I'm Pastor Brady Johnston, and just want to give a warm welcome to all of you. Uh, whether you're a longtime member or a first-time guest, we're glad that you're here, and we have the chance to come together as the body of Christ uh, to lift the name of Jesus high in our community and in our world. So thank you for, for being here. Uh, this time I'm going to ask our kids to come up and meet me up front as they get a blessing before you go a godly place. So y'all come, come on up. All right. Come on over. All right. 
Well, it is good to see all of you. We're still coming down. All right. So I wanted to share with you a quick story before you go to Godly Play. So there is a story in the Bible where the disciples are asking Jesus who can be the greatest in God's kingdom. They're saying, which one of us can be the best in your eyes, Jesus? And so Jesus looks around for an example because he wants to teach them something really important. And he looks around and he sees someone that can be a good example to the disciples. And he calls them over and guess who it was? It was a child. A child. And Jesus takes this child and he looks at the disciples and he says, you must become like this child. You must change and become like these little children. And, and there's something really important in that that I think you need to hear. Um, we often think in the church about how much as adults we have to teach y'all. But the truth is you have so much to teach us. Because there's something beautiful about your hearts and the way that you trust God. That when God says, I love you and I'm with you, you believe him. And you look to God because you know that you need God. And sometimes as adults we can forget those things. It sounds like simple things, but we can as adults sometimes forget them. And so you are a constant reminder of the kind of faith that Jesus says that we should have. And I love that when Jesus looks at a bunch of adults who sometimes don't always get it right, and he says, you know what? You need to grow up into little children, to be little children in your faith. And so thank you so much for being a great example to us. We really appreciate you, and we're excited that you get a chance to learn in godly place. So let's pray together, okay? Um, God, we praise you for our children. We thank you for their example to us and all that they have to teach us by the way they love you and trust you. So may you meet them in godly play. May you encourage each of their hearts. And we love you so much. Amen. All right. Church, we're going to continue in our worship. By singing one of my favorite hymns. It's about how God is our rock, our firm foundation. Now, we usually call this the uh, prayer song, um, and it's just your time to meet with Him. Now, if you got something on your heart that you need to talk with Him about, now is the time to do that. Um, altar rails are always open. If you want to come down there, pray. You can do that as well. If you want to stand and sing, you can do that. If you want to stay seated, like I said, this is your time just to be with him and to listen. Sing Rock of Ages. Rock of Ages. the lake. 
sinful life. Wash me, save. Church, let's pray. So Jesus, what more can we say that you are our rock upon which we stand? How without you we have nothing. All the things of this world cannot satisfy, no matter how hard we chase after them, no matter how much effort we put into them, God, it will always. <laughs> they were never meant to satisfy us, so they will always fail at some point. Happiness we might get for a little while. Joy we might get for a little while. God, you are the only one to fill. In this wide hole in our hearts. So thank you for being our all-sufficient Savior. Thank you for being everything that we could ever need. And so God, we just want to tell you that we worship you. And we love you this morning. And we thank you, Jesus, that you taught this perfect, beautiful prayer to your disciples. And so we get to repeat it today. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bible with you, I invite you to turn to Luke chapter 11. Uh, we're in, currently in a sermon series looking through Jesus' parables. Actually, all of them. Uh, so we'll be spending the next few months in, in his parables. And uh, our series is called uh, Ears to Hear, which is an invitation that Jesus often gives after his parables, which is an invitation to listen, and, and to listen intently. Uh, when I think of this idea of ears, having ears to hear, I think of what James says in James chapter 1, verse 22. When James says, Do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. In other words, don't think just because you're sitting here in a chair hearing me read the word that you've checked the box and moved on, that you've accomplished the task. No, the idea is to bring, to hear it and then to bring a heart of obedience to what we hear. And so that the faithful response before I even read this word is that we as God's people say yes. Whatever you say, yes, yes. We're not listening to go, well, do I want to do that? Like, no, we're saying, I, we believe, we trust you, you're good. We, we say yes to you before we even hear you speak to us through your word. Um, and so James says, we do that, man, we, you'll be blessed. You'll be blessed. Um, and so let us hear the word of God, beginning in, in verse 1 in Luke chapter 11. 
One day Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. Then Jesus said to them, When you pray, say, Our Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. Then Jesus said to them, Suppose you have a friend, and you go with him who and you go to him at midnight and say, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, Don't bother me, the door's already locked, and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So, I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. A uh, lot of fun stuff to work through on this one. Uh, start with this thought. So my favorite professor in seminary was a man named Dr. Louis Zabinden. He was the senior pastor of First Presbyterian San Antonio for over 30 years. And he was one of those people who just carried a kind of authority with them in just about everything they did. And Dr. Zabinden loved to pray when we were in class. In fact, there were times he would stop the class early and lead us in prayer. And I remember one day in my Christian ministry class, about 15 minutes before class was scheduled to end, he said, hey, I feel like we just need to pray. And so he had us put our books aside and we just, just stopped for some prayer. And he led us in what was just a powerful uh, time of prayer. I mean, it felt like the heavens split open for a moment and we saw the glory of God. And we get done and everybody, all the students were just kind of sitting there, kind of basking in this moment, this beautiful moment we have in class under this just great prayer. And finally, one of the students breaks the silence and she says, Dr. Zabinden, can you teach a class on how to pray like that? Like, chances are you've experienced something like that, something so powerful that moved you. You thought, God, I want to pray like whatever I've just experienced. And, and that's the same thing we see of the disciples here, that we find them in a moment that was common for their experience with Jesus, where they're praying with Jesus. And, and after they're through praying, Jesus, I imagine, is still praying. And they ask him when he's done, Jesus, can you teach us how to pray. And it's not like these guys didn't know how to pray. They grew up memorizing prayers. They prayed multiple times a day. Uh, they prayed with their families. Like, these guys knew how to pray. But what they're asking is, Jesus, can you teach us to pray like you pray? And I imagine many of us in the room or watching online are thinking, uh, yes. Like, I, Jesus, I want to know how to pray like you pray. Like, teach me. And how grateful we are that the disciples asked this question and that the gospel writers all felt it was important enough to include here. Because Jesus will teach them and teach us how to pray. And what comes out of this question are some beautiful things for us to consider. We find there are two main things that come out of this request. Jesus gives the disciples first the Lord's Prayer, something that sounds really familiar given you prayed it just a few minutes before I read it. 
And he gives them the Lord's Prayer, and then he gives them what we call the parable of the friend at midnight. And these are not two independent teachings. Actually, Jesus arranges these in a way to show us that actually they're dependent upon each other to give us a whole perspective of how we ought to pray. And they very much work together. And and here's what we see when we start to look at these. We see that in the Lord's Prayer, what Jesus does is he teaches us what to pray. That Jesus teaches us the content of what our prayers should look like when we come to the Father in prayer. So if you're wondering, what, what should I be praying about? The Lord's Prayer will answer that question for you. And in the parable of the friend at midnight, what Jesus does is Jesus teaches us how we should pray. He teaches us the posture of prayer, the spirit, the attitude, the faith that we must bring to our praying if we want to pray like Jesus prays. And so if you want the picture, we look at both of these together to see. And and when we do this, we can begin to understand like this is the kind of of heart that Jesus brings to his praying that you and I can learn from and and gain a lot of insight into our own practices. So we're going to look at all 13 verses today. And we're going to start with the Lord's Prayer, but uh, we're going to have most of our emphasis be on the parable. So consider this a crash course in the Lord's Prayer. Uh, We spent seven weeks in this a couple years ago. I've got seven minutes, so I'm going to leave some things on the table for you to to milk out of the Lord's Prayer. But I want us to get a perspective of what Jesus is doing and when he's telling us what we should pray. Uh, When you look at the Lord's Prayer, and it's easy to do in Luke's version because Luke's version is the shortest of all the versions of Jesus' prayer in the Gospels. Uh, when you look at it, there, you see that there's two kind of, of, there's a division point of two different subjects that Jesus focuses upon. And we see that his first focus in his prayer is upon God. That that's where Jesus chooses to begin the prayer that he's using to teach us how to pray. He starts with his emphasis on God. We see it in verse 2. He says, when you pray, say, Father hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. And so the first thing that Jesus does is he begins his prayer with with a focus upon who God is in his nature and upon God's will. That's what Jesus begins his prayer with. And one thing this teaches us that if we want to pray like Jesus, the foundation of our prayer must be who God is. That before Jesus lays anything before the Father, it's worship. That it isn't just rolling into our needs. Like Jesus stops and he settles into, like I'm going to put my attention upon the one to whom I'm praying. And that he just settles into the nature, the character, the being of God, and and upon the greatness of God's will, not only for his life, but for the world. And that's how Jesus starts his praying. And for many of us, there's a lesson there, because that's not often where we start. But when we choose to begin that way, with an emphasis on that, what that does is that changes the way that we pray. Instead of casually moving into an awareness of who we're praying to, when we stop and settle into it, it it yields a kind of perspective over all of our praying. It helps us see our lives and the world in a completely different light when we stop to truly consider in the depths of our being who our Father in heaven is. And that's the way that Jesus begins his prayer. We see in verse 3 the second focus, and it's um, a focus upon us. And when I say us, um, I don't mean us individually, as in our individual needs. I'm talking about the needs of the community. I don't know if you caught that. Jesus prays in the plural. He says in verse 3, Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. 
And so Jesus, in the second part of what he's praying, in this model prayer he gives us, is he prays for our needs and teaches us how to pray and think about our needs. And if you look at it, um, Jesus teaches us how to pray first for our physical needs, for daily bread, which represents the nourishment, the needs that our, our body has on a daily basis to function. Um, and, and so he prays for our physical needs. The second thing he does is he prays for relational needs. Uh, he says he prays that we have the strength to forgive others. Because you can't have healthy relationships if you can't forgive. Like that's just the nature of being in relationships. He, he also prays for our spiritual needs. He says, Father, forgive us. Like we sin. Not only do people sin against us, but we sin against other people. We sin against you. And we need your grace in our lives. And then he says, Father, would you protect us? from the spiritual forces of evil around us in the world. And so that's how Jesus teaches us to pray and to think about our needs. And I think a fitting question, kind of final question, that we can put all of this into some perspective about what we should pray, I think the question that we need to stop and think about is like, well, what, what role should this prayer have in our life? Because we pray it every week. And there have been times I thought, ah, oh, that gets kind of mundane because I can pray the Lord's Prayer and, and think about who I'm going to draft in my fantasy football um, at my 2 o'clock draft today. Um, like, you can you memorize something, you can do that and, and disengage when you're saying it. Uh, if you have some good suggestions, please see me afterwards. I'm kind of lost in this season. So. But we can pray and disengage, right? But I think, I think what actually the reason Jesus gives us this prayer um, is that I believe this prayer at its heart is a vision for the kind of people that Jesus wants us to become. Like, I think this is a prayer that when we stop to consider it and we actually begin to engage with it can, can be a prayer that we grow toward. If that makes sense. But think about it this way. So like this prayer, it, it, it's, it's to look at it saying, be the kind of person who lives with an awareness of your Father in heaven, of who he is, of his being and his nature. You be the kind of person who lifts up the will of God and says, I want your will to break out in my life and in the world around me. To be the kind of person who looks to your Father and trusts him absolutely for whatever your physical needs might be. To look at your father and say, God, I need your forgiveness, but I don't only want to be a forgiven person. I want to be a forgiving person. Who looks at your father in heaven and says, in spite of all the evil around me, like I trust you to be my shepherd, to protect me. Like we're looking at that and some of us are going, man, I've got some... We, we begin to see, like, that's a vision of, of the person I need to grow into believing and becoming. And that's what I think the role of this prayer is. It teaches us what to say, certainly. But I think even more than that, it's a vision of what we are to become when we allow God's grace and God's spirit to transform us. And so if you're thinking, like, what can I do in my prayer life to start praying the, the what, the content that Jesus prays, then take the Lord's Prayer. That's a practical thing that you can do starting after the service to think about this and just take the words and expand the words for you and let them be your words that you offer up to the Father. And as you pray them, don't think about your fantasy football draft. Like think about or grocery list or whatever. Like think about what this means and what Jesus by his grace and help will help us grow toward if we would trust in him. So I think that's the, the what of the Lord's Prayer, that the content that we pray, because it helps us become. This is God's will and his vision for the people that he wants to make of his kingdom. And so if, we're, if we've looked at the what, if the Lord's Prayer is the what, then I think the, the question is, well, what role does the, the parable play? And the parable plays the role of teaching us how we should pray. Now that we know some of the content that should make up our prayers, this is how we should pray. And it's the parable, the, it's known as the parable of the friend at midnight. 
And it's this funny story about this guy who has a friend come on a long journey, comes to him at midnight, and he uh, it has to be hospitable. And so he has to go search out some food to find to feed his friend. Um, and I'm willing to bet when we read this parable, some of you were thinking, like, I know the friend in my life who would do that to me. Like, I know the guy or girl who would have, you know, would come to me at midnight expecting, you know, a warm meal and me to put him up for the night. Like, I know exactly who that is. And for us, that might be a little irregular, but it wasn't for them in their day. In fact, it was common that when you set out on a journey, whether it's to visit someone or go to Jerusalem to worship, that you would just go and you would stop where you needed to stop and you would expect to find hospitality, whether it was among a friend or someone that you didn't know. Now that sounds really strange to us, but it was actually really important. Um, The reason people didn't call ahead or text is because they couldn't. And the people who were poor didn't have a way to get news out that you were coming. And so to make long journeys where you would exhaust your resources and exhaust yourself by making the journey, um, because of that and, and the vulnerability you experience when you travel, hospitality became a kind of key virtue or value in their culture. In fact, part of your opinion kind of rested on your capacity to show hospitality to people who would come to you. And so you would travel to villages knowing if I needed to stop, you know, I I can stop here and these people will welcome me. They'll help me rest. They'll give me food, uh, whatever, whatever I need. And so you would from time to time just have someone you know or a visitor just come by your house expecting something without calling or texting. And aren't we glad that's changed? Like, man, I mean, how many of you, would you come home from church and like your in-laws are in the driveway like, hey, what's for lunch? You know, uh, we're here for the next week. Surprise. <laughs> you know, but, but like hospitality was vital. And that's why this story plays out in the way that it does. Um, Jesus tells a story about a man who is intruded upon by a friend who then he is now forced to go and intrude on someone else. And for all the introverts in the room, you just got really uncomfortable with the thought of having to go knock on someone's door at midnight. Um, And it turns out the guy who gets his door knocked on is less than thrilled about the situation himself. Um, In fact, he thinks what every parent thinks, right, with young kids, um, you know, man, don't wake up my kids. Like, you know... Take the bread, take my home, I don't care, just don't wake up my kids. You know, that's what every young parent feels, you know. Like, I don't have the energy to put them back to bed again. Um, Just don't wake up my kids. And what's funny about this parable um, is that Jesus makes it really clear that the man is actually not interested in helping his friend. Like, like he doesn't want to get up and give him the bread, but he does. And, and Jesus also makes it clear that it's not for noble reasons, is it? It's not like the guy's like, oh, I just thank you for the opportunity of serving you. Um, I'm so blessed to get to do that. No, like his motivation is like, I just want to get you off my back. Like, I know you're going to sit here and knock at the door until I give you something, so I just better do it now so you can save me the misery of of having to put my kids back to bed. And so Jesus calls this, that that the whole thing that thrusts this parable and makes it happen, he calls it a, a shameless audacity on behalf of the knocker. You know, a shameless audacity. And, and the word uh, for shameless audacity actually means uh, persistence to the point of annoyance. It's persisting to the point that you annoy somebody. And I, that makes me laugh just a little bit because like, that's the heroic action in this parable is that you persist to the point that you're annoying somebody into giving you what you want. That's funny to me. I don't know, maybe to you, but like I, like seriously, and and that's what makes this parable confusing to a lot of people as they look at this and go, well, how can that possibly be the moral? You know, like, and especially if we apply this to prayer, does 
God find our prayers annoying? And he's just saying, just you know, annoy me until finally I cave to your, your desires. You just finally wear me out you know, with all your praying that I'll give you what you want so you stop bothering me. Like surely that isn't the moral of this story, is it? And if you have your suspicions, then congratulations, you're right. That's not the moral of the story. And that's because this isn't a moral parable. So in many of Jesus' parables, there's a moral to the story that informs something about God's nature or about the kingdom of God that tells us something very important. And in a moral story, you can often look at and see, hey, here's the one who represents God in the story. We think of the sower, right? The one who sows and casts the good news. That's Jesus. And so, uh, but this isn't a moral parable. So if you're looking for God in the story, you're not going to find him, okay? Um, and, and so here's, here's what this parable is. This is a parable that's known as a greater than parable. And, and here's how a greater than parable works. Um, you start with what was considered a very low example of something that's true. So you take something that everybody would agree is true. It maybe isn't good or ideal, but it is true. And it's kind of the lowest common, the bar is low, the low common denominator of what can be true in a circumstance. And then you use that as a springboard to point to a beautiful or wonderful or high kind of truth. So you start low. And by means of contrasting something low and not really all that appealing, you, you look to something beautiful and wonderful as a way to highlight how good that thing really is. And so let's put that in the context of this parable. Jesus says to us, look, if you know you have a need, you know that you can go to your neighbor and you can ask them for what you need. And you know your neighbor may not want to help you. They may not even like you. But because of the cultural expectations and pressures, um, it doesn't matter. They're going to give you what you want anyways. If that's true, then how much more can you trust your Father in heaven who loves you? Make some sense now. Some of you are like, whew, all right. Uh, I was kind of worried there for a little bit with the whole moral thing. No, like Jesus is saying, look, come on, guys. Like, you know you can go to anybody in your community, and they may be even mad that you came, but you know and you have confidence when you go to them that they will give you what you need. But man, how much more confidence should you have when you go to your Father in heaven who absolutely loves you, who to his core is good and faithful and just? Like how much more can you trust that he will respond to your need? Like this, this parable, it's about trust. It's about us having trust and confidence in our Heavenly Father and in His love for us and what that means for us, His children. And Jesus goes on. I mean, in verse 9, He, he continues this, this idea and He holds it out there for us. Um, we can feel the, the point kind of coming home in verse 9 when He says, So I say to you, like here's the point, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and and the door will be open to you. Jesus gives in just one verse, three verbs, very um, active verbs. Um, ask, seek, and knock. Now, each of these verbs are in what we call the present imperative form. Um, if you're trying to think back to like eighth grade English to remember exactly what that means, uh, present imperative is like a command with an ongoing action. So what Jesus is really saying is, Keep on asking. Keep on seeking. Keep on knocking. This is an invitation. That's what this is. This isn't stop pestering me and I'll give you what you want. Like this is, no, you keep asking. Keep seeking after me. Keep knocking at the door. Like I'm inviting you to do this. I'm not dissuading you. I'm trying to invite, to persuade you, to keep 
pursuing me, keep coming near to me. Because what happens uh, at this invitation is even more beautiful in verse 10. If, as if it isn't enough that the Father wants us to come to him. Like, listen to what Jesus says in verse 10. He says, For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, the door will be open for you. This is promise. Jesus not only invites us to go, to come, and to ask, and to seek, and to knock. Jesus says, when you do, the Father will show up in your praying. When you do, the Father will meet you in your praying. When you do, the Father will hear you, and the Father will respond to you, and the Father will give to you, and the Father will bless you. Jesus says you have the invitation, but you also have a promise that says when you go into that place and you ask for the needs, you go trusting and knowing that he's going to meet you there. And it begs a question, like, do we believe that? I mean, really, just a moment for like a spiritual inventory here. Do you believe that when you go to the Father and you ask, whatever need it might be, whether it's a physical need for you or, or a neighbor or your loved one, or whether it's a, a spiritual need or um, a relational need, do you believe that God hears you and that God is moving in, in light of your praying? Do you believe that when you seek after him, whether it's to know the Father more deeply or whether it's, it's to seek after discernment or wisdom for something in your life, that if you keep pressing toward him and moving toward that he'll move to you and give you the wisdom that you need in your life? Or that if you knock at the door, which is, which is a highly relational term in Scripture, if you keep knocking at the door because you want to know him more, that the Father won't throw open that door so that you begin to see him and encounter him in ways you never have before. Do you believe that? Because that's what this is about. If this is the how we should pray, the posture out of which we should pray, Jesus is saying when you come to the Father in prayer, you come to him with faith. You come to him looking at his goodness and his nature. You come to him and, and you just, you trust him because you know, God, you are good. God, you are faithful. You're the one who, who Exodus, you've so, you showed us in Exodus that your loving kindness stretches from generation to generation to generation. Like that's who you are. So I can come to you as a beloved child of yours and put my needs in front of you and have the utmost confidence that you and your goodness are going to be present and working. And sometimes that means I get what I want, but it always means I get what I need. That's what this is. The, the posture of prayer is a posture of trust and faith in the Father to be good because he is good, to be faithful because he is faithful. And for you to experience his love, because that's who he is. And just in case we, we miss that point, Jesus will make that point again in the last three verses. He'll circle back to it and say it in a different way, just in case you, you need another angle to understand it. In verses 11 and 12, Jesus asks a question to the disciples right there. He says, which of you fathers, of which obviously some of the disciples were fathers, says, if your son asks you for a fish, we'll give him a snake. Or if he asks for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion. So which one of you dads, right? If your kid asks for something good, we'll give them something dangerous or something evil. In Luke chapter 10, Jesus uses a scorpion and a snake as an example of evil and danger. Which one of you, if your kid asks for something good, will give them something that will harm them? The obvious answer is, well, none of us. Like, no one would do. Like, you, you kidding me? Like, we love our kids, right? Um, and that's the answer Jesus wants you to have. And then in verse 13, he'll bring the point home 
Um, but he takes a little dig. Maybe you felt it when I read this. He says, well, good. If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give? Um, ouch, right? Like, <laughs> a little harsh, Jesus. He's like, evil. Like, what do you mean by you who are evil? Well, you see it the example, right? The greater than. So, like, let's go ahead and take that on. So, Jesus is obviously playing off of our sinful nature when he calls us evil here. Um, and, and let's look at what he means. Okay, let's be really honest with ourselves for a moment. Um, as human beings, we are awfully complex. And we are this, like, interesting mixture of what are sometimes volatile emotions and varying motivations. And sometimes our circumstances can create an interesting concoction between the two. And what that often results in is fairly inconsistent behavior. Or we can take the same circumstance and respond to it in a different way, given the different things that are happening and going on inside of us or around us. Not our heads. Is that, that true? Yeah. I mean, take the, the parable, like the circumstance of this parable, for instance. Let's say on Friday night, you had a good night. And Friday, who doesn't love Fridays, right? You're off of work. you got the weekend ahead of you. Everybody loves a Friday. You went out to eat to a good restaurant on Friday night. Um, you went home. You sat down to watch one of your favorite movies in your chair or sofa, and you fell asleep. And you wake up to a knock at your door, and your neighbor needs something. And you needed to get up and go back to bed anyways. But So you greet your neighbor, and you're like, oh, what do you need? I'm happy to help you out. But Saturday, Saturday wasn't a great day for you. You'd gotten a letter from your HOA the week before that you needed to go out and work in your yard. And it was 109 that day. And who likes working in the yard when it's 109 degrees? Makes everybody upset, right? Uh, well, you go through your day, and then you had other things that you didn't want to do on a Saturday when you'd rather be at home. You had to go do those things. And to top it off, you go to bed with a fight with your spouse. So when somebody knocks on your door at midnight and wakes you up, you're thinking, who am I going to hurt? Right? Like, that's... Same scenario, right? But like different conditions in, in us. You're like, who, who am I going to hurt? And we wouldn't do that. I mean, we know that. Um, we don't handle our business that way. We would just wait till they leave and then write a passive-aggressive Facebook post about the whole incident. That's, <laughs> that's the way that we adults handle their business today, right? Yeah, that's uh, amen to that. Uh, no, but like, we, we, like we're inconsistent, right? Like we can't always be trusted to do the right thing. Sometimes our motivations change, our emotions can change. And so Jesus is like, his point is like, look, if, if you who have this like inconsistency in your behavior and your actions and what you feel, and it results in different, you can't always be trusted to do what's right. But still, when it comes to people that you love, you're going to give them something good. You know that, right? If even you who are inconsistent know how to give good things, man, how much more will your Father in heaven? give you what is good. And in fact, his point isn't even what gives what is good. It's to give you the greatest of all gifts, right? Will give you the Holy Spirit. Luke says, you want to know what the Father's heart is? It's to give you the Holy Spirit. In just a few chapters, Luke says, uh, the Father is pleased to give us the kingdom. He says that in verse 12. Here he says, to give us the Holy Spirit in chapter 11. His point is that look what the Father's done. He's thrown everything open for you. He's made it all available to you because he loves you. And through the Spirit, he wants to invite you in to share in his very life. And so the Father, if he will give you this gift, if he will send his Son to give his life for you, that you might be one with him, if he'll give his Spirit so that you can begin to engage in life with God here and now, a Spirit who's just a foretaste of the blessing that's to come when we finally go to be with him. Like if he will give us these things, then won't he meet you in your prayers and whatever you need? Won't he respond to you? This God who is so good, who has thrown open every blessing in the kingdom, every blessing through his spirit. And Jesus says, you want to pray like me, you go into prayer trusting that. You go into prayer praying this, and you go into prayer praying out of that trust and confidence in the one to whom you're praying. And that's what Jesus does here. And this is what he teaches us, those of us who want to learn how to pray like Jesus prays. If you want to come up and join us in, in praying, you're welcome to do so. Our prayer altars are open 
here and, and through kind of our, our song of response, um, they're here for you to meet with God. Um, um, I'm going to lead us in prayer, and you can pray with me in your seats or online, uh, but let's, let's pray together. Jesus, we are grateful that you teach us how to pray like you pray. And God, we long to know you, um, to be able to pray like this, to pray that your will would be um, a part of our life and the, the thing that makes our heart beat. That we would become the kind of people who are forgiving, the kind of people who trust you and look to you. Um, would you teach us as we go from this place and, and, and seek to grow in our praying, would you show us and help these truths come to life for us? that we not only would gather the skill of how to pray, but that we would become the kind of people that, that, that embody your prayer. That's our hope. And we pray this, Jesus, in your great and wonderful name. Amen. Yeah, let's, let's stand and respond. Ravish my heart. How great his love is.
So we have the joy of receiving Les and Marlene Stark into our membership here today and got some people that they love want to be over here next to them. And so y'all come on over. So Les and Marlene, uh, I'm going to ask y'all, do y'all want to support our church with your prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness? Amen. All right. Well, we're glad to, to have y'all uh, officially in joining the church and been a part of our life for a little while. Yeah. You know, I know it's uh, in today's world, people don't tend to join things as much, but there's something beautiful about saying, hey, I know God has called me to be present here and to use my gifts and graces to bless the community, to be blessed by the community, um, and certainly to bless the world around us. So we're so glad to have y'all. Um, let's have prayer together to celebrate. So would you join with me? Um, Father, we are so grateful to have Les and Marlene um, hear the call to join our church we know, God, that you have given us a vision of being a church that makes a difference in the world and our community because you're the one who comes to make a difference in our world and community. You call us to join you and your work in the world, and so we're grateful when we hear that call, we respond to it, and we pray that you would work through us to encourage us and build us up here in our life together so that we can go out and, and transform, be a part of your work in the world. And so we're grateful for Les and Marlene and this time to receive them here. Uh, we pray this in your wonderful name. Amen. Amen. All right. I'm going to have you all stay up here so you all can come and welcome them. Uh, we have a couple of announcements before we go. Uh, one of those is that tonight we have Discover Grace from 5 to 7. Um, is that right? Kikili's nodding. Good. 5 to 7 in here. It's a worship service. Very friendly to kids and uh, families, and but everybody's welcome to come. Um, so that'll be a, a great opportunity. On Wednesday nights, uh, we'll pick up our Wednesday night programs. We'll pick up this Wednesday. It'll be a normal schedule, so you can see them all up. I'm not go through all of them. Uh, we invite you to come and be a part of those. It's going to be a great day uh, for us. We also have uh, Food for Kids. Last week, we talked about Food for Kids um, and the need to serve. We are already on week one up to 177 students. So that's a lot. We ended. We fed about 200 a year last year. We're going to feed more. And so if you want to support by one serving on Wednesdays, uh, we do have a, a rep uh, who's over. Oh, Kathy Berg right there. Uh, we'll have Kathy go stand over there. And so you can go see her if you have questions about how to help. We'd love for you to support Food for Kids financially. $30 will cover one student for a month. Um, to make sure they have food over the weekends, 270 for the year. Love for you to consider that. If you'd like to let us know you're supporting, if you do at least $30, you get one of these fun magnets you can put on your refrigerator. And when you go to get food, to pray for whatever student you're supporting. It's a great way to help nourish the soul as well as the body. So um, we also have another opportunity to serve in what we're calling our Oopsie Ministry, um, which is a great, because we've all gone Oopsie before. Okay. Uh, anyway, so it's like when a kids, this is with J, a partnership with J.R. Irvin uh, to provide, you know, underwear and some clothes for kids that might have an accident at school. So there's a list of clothes you can bring, um, and there's boxes that you can put those in. Great way to partner and uh, to help some kids in our community. Um, so that's, 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 that's a lot to, to be a part of. Um, but man, uh, if you're a first-time guest with us, I know Ms. Shannon, Ms. Valerie would love to bless you with something. And they got something better than daily bread. They've got Joy's cookies. So you won't want to miss that. If you're a guest, man, um, yeah, this is awesome. So go see them. They love to bless you. Um, so, hey, let's hear the benediction. Um, go out there and annoy people until they give you what you want. Um, I'm teasing. That's not it at all. Um, no, like, like, hey, we have the vision of who Christ is calling us to be, who by the power of Jesus at work we can become. If we would pray and bring a heart of faith, like let's become the kind of people that Jesus is calling us to be, the kind of people who trust the Father um, and the work that he's doing. Amen.